it's right not. Yeah. So I uh, hooked the thermostat back into one of the others. Oh. Extenders so that you could control it if you needed to. I probably need to check with the others and set them back up too. Um, yeah. But I'll get to that. Okay. But you know. Good morning. It is uh, good to see you this morning. And uh, we want to uh, remind you of a couple of things. A blood drive's coming up. Be sure you sign up for that. There's a need in our community. And we appreciate your participation last time. But uh, we've got another one coming up. And then there's another exciting game night, right? Yes. Yes, in a couple of weeks on uh, March 24th. About 30 on uh, Friday, we're going to have subs for dinner and then game night. And we are going to play board games, but also we're going to have family feud Elk River style. So Robin has coordinated and got some people lined up. And if you'd like to participate, maybe tell her, hey, I'd like to be a contestant. But we know how it works. But what we thought would be fun is if we get to have some questions that say, we surveyed 100 Elk River people, top three answers are on the board. So after... After service, we're going to be at the doors. It takes about three minutes to do these. If you do take them, please get them back to me by Wednesday, and uh, we'll have a lot of fun, and you all will too. Thanks. Good morning. Okay, it's almost officially spring. Spring means flowers. Flowers means the youth are once again selling flower baskets from grits. Now, the, the church has been challenged the last, I don't know how long, with no share drive. So we were not able to get last year's order forms to update them. So we've had to use GRITS order forms, and they are outside to your right. Once again, we have everything that we had available last year. These are absolutely beautiful, healthy baskets. They will be in before Mother's Day. But we have a very short turnaround this year because GRITS got us the information just last week. We need your orders by the first Sunday in April. March 26th is what's on the forms. You can put your money in the offering boxes or pay online. You can also order online. 
Baskets this year are $15. That is less than the capital market for these things. And you have your option of baskets and flats of plants. I ask you all to support our youth. If you work, take a few extra forms and share them in your break room. See if you can get some more. And I have a challenge for the youth because this fundraiser is for the youth. The youth that sells the most flowers, the most items, will get a $25 Amazon gift card, and that's from me personally. So, there's a little bit of an incentive for the youth to get involved selling this year because this is your fundraiser, guys. It's for the youth. So I want the youth to get involved selling this year. I think that would be good. If you have any questions, give me a shout. Um, the orders are available. On, like I said, you can order online like we usually do. And I, I ask you all to please consider ordering your, your baskets and your flats of plants. I guarantee you the quality is there. And the price is definitely right. $15 for a whole flat of 32 plants is a good deal. That's a really good deal. $15 for a hanging basket of a flower or a Boston fern. $15 is a good deal for a fern, especially the great big ones. So you can also get mixed vegetable flats or you can get a $25 gift card. If you want to pick out what you want specifically at Grits in the Capital Market, then you can purchase a gift card and go spend it there and the church still gets the credit for the youth. So please support our youth and consider getting your flowers order forms, like I said, are out here on the right along with the big color picture. So thank you guys. Let's stand and let's worship together. He became sin, who knew no sin, that he might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah. Name of the whole names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. the wine broken and poured out all for love the whole world trembled the veil was torn love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah name above all names blessed redeemer emmanuel the rescue for sinners the ransom from heaven jesus messiah Lord of all, all our hope is in you, all our hope is in you, all the glory to you, God, the light of the world, Jesus Messiah. Above all names, by 
blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, and the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Lord of all, Lord of all. all. Give the Lord praise this morning. close to us and he picks us up when we're weary. He touches us when we need a physical touch. He encourages us in our times of discouragement just by coming into his presence. We're privileged today to come into the presence of the Lord. Would you be seated? I want to give you just a couple of requests. Continue to pray for the Edwards family. It was hard, but it was a joyous celebration this week, knowing that we have the hope of heaven and the hope of reuniting. Continue to pray for Rod Green. Danny, Lucas, Rusty Lynch, and we have several who have had COVID. We want to remember those as well. Then I received a text on the the way to First Church this morning. Michelle Bailey has uh, two vertebrae that are fractured and is in severe pain. She was just with us last week. But let's remember to pray for, for Michelle this morning as well. Let's sing that chorus again in an attitude of prayer. In the presence of Jehovah, God Almighty, Prince of Vanish. Our 
in the presence of the King. Let's pray. Father, we do bow in the presence of the Almighty. We thank you, Lord, that you've promised that wherever two or three are gathered, that you would be among us. And today, Lord, we've already sensed your goodness, your mercy and your grace and your presence in this place. Lord, I pray this morning that you would help each one of us to open our hearts and open our ears in worship to you, in response to your word and to what you speak to our hearts. We pray, Lord, for your continued comfort for the Edwards family. Be their strength. Be their hope. We pray, Lord, for your touch upon Danny. We pray, Lord, for our friend Rod. And this morning, Lord, we pray especially for Michelle. Her desire is to be here among her church family, but yet again, Lord, there's been a break or a fracture. Father, I pray that you would help in relieving that pain. I pray that you would give wisdom to those who are caring for her. Draw close to her. May she know that there are people who are praying for her and lifting her up to you. Continue to touch Rusty physically and those who are battling viruses and COVID and spring illnesses. Draw close. May they sense your presence even today. Lord, again, I pray that you would help us to clear our minds, clear our thoughts, open our hearts to what you have to say to us today. And in the name of Jesus, we pray all of these things. Amen. Amen.
Thank you. Thank you, choir. Let's join in lifting our hearts to the Lord. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, it trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands. Beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God had three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Think about the 
these words. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, O oh my God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great our God. Amen. He's worthy of our praise. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise him. Amen. Amen. He is worthy. And how great is he? Amen. Amen. Don't you just love being together? You miss something if you're not here in person, don't you? It's a good fellowship with each other, the good presence of the Lord, and uh, what a joy. And uh, let, me say, let me say thank you to Debbie Fields and uh, Barbara Keys and Angela Foster. Put together, they've been working for six months, uh, put together a women's conference yesterday. The presence of the Lord was here. There were over 200 ladies, and the men tried to stay away as far as they could. But, uh, and, and the women preferred that as well. But uh, it was a great day. Thank you, ladies, for taking the time. And thank all of those who participated and helped in making it a, a successful day. The presence of the Lord gathers whenever we gather together. And so you watch for some events of uh, Hope Builders coming up, uh, many things coming up in the, in the days ahead, and you need to, to be a part of that as well. Pam Darnold's going to come and share with us. Can't speak so close I can feel you breathe you're so holy and Worthy, you know where I've been. I can't move so close to you. I'm see through, no, not innocent like you. Oh, God, I'm sorry. I'm living in all. You don't need me at all. But you couldn't love me more. Mm -hmm. I'm living in all. And every day I fall. But you never let me go. Mm -hmm. I'm living in all. Oh. I'm living in all, oh, oh, oh. I can't speak so close, I can see you breathe, you're so holy, unworthy, you know where I've been. I can't move so close to you, I'm see-through, no, no. Like you, oh God, I'm sorry. I'm living in all. Cause you don't need me at all. And 
You couldn't love me more. Mm -hmm. I'm living in awe, and every day I fall, but you never. Thank you, Pam. Living in awe, A-W-E, if you didn't get that. Living in awe of him. Larry. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 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 Thank you, Larry. Thank you very much. Larry can be pretty scary when you look at him. But he's a teddy bear at heart, I'll tell you that. All right, man. That's a little bit scary. about it. Anyway, this Wednesday morning, um, this coming week, we're going to get together down in the fellowship hall about 830 and we're going to study God's word. Amen. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody, all the men folk, it's a men's Bible study. Sorry. That's right. Pal. That's right, ladies. But y'all can get, make you up one, do one if you want to. That was something yesterday. I was uh, that was a blessing. I sat out there in the foyer and listened to that music, and it was like angels singing. All right, well, y'all come to Bible study, please. Um, we study God's word in there, and yeah, we get in some arguments about it sometimes. But it's like that's why you study. That's why we study God's word. All right, where you at, Kelly? There you go. <laughs> Don't forget that. There's things going on at the church all of the time. 8.30 every Wednesday morning. Men gather together. Uh, maybe one week you can make it and another week you can't. You're still invited. It's not something that uh, 
is ongoing that you're going to miss something. It's, uh, they come together, they um, study God's word, they pray together. And what else do Nazarenes do? Oh, eat. Yes, they eat together. And, uh, yes. Oh, biscuits and gravy this week. Normally it's donuts, but biscuits and gravy. So you have a bigger incentive to be here this week. But it is a great time of fellowship, a great time of learning. You see, gathering together on Sunday mornings is a wonderful experience. It's when we experience God's presence as a corporate body. But through our life groups at 9.30 on Sunday morning, on Wednesday evening, there's groups that meet. On uh, Wednesday morning, the men's group meets. There are opportunities in a smaller setting to get to know people a little more and to dig a little deeper into God's word. And so those are important times. Don't, don't talk yourself out of it. Don't, don't think, well, I don't know any of those people. They're just as weird as you are, so it's okay. <laughs> but do, do be a part of everything that's happening around the church. I, again, thank you for, for being here. And, and I don't know about you, <clears throat> but I do stand in awe of how God can use me how God can choose to use everyone, just ordinary people. God chose to use the three ladies to put together a wonderful conference that uplifted his name. It wasn't about the speakers. It wasn't about the music. It was about bringing people together and worshiping the Lord together. But I don't know about you, but I remember <clears throat> as, a, as a teenager of being rescued. Now you say, what were you rescued from? Well, anybody who was a bully, anybody who was, <laughs> no. I was rescued when I realized that even though I wasn't a bad person, even though I didn't do things that maybe others did, I still needed a savior. I still needed to be rescued from spending eternity in a place called hell. And I remember being rescued. It wasn't in a church setting. Now, I know it's hard for you to believe, but I was riding a bicycle. Yes, I used to like to do a little bit of exercise. As a teenager, I was riding the bicycle, and I would go up my grandpa's hill just as far as I could, and then, you know, you get to coast back and and it was on that hillside, and it was something that was said. I couldn't tell you what was said in that service that Sunday morning. But it was something that was heavy on my heart. Because an adult came to me and asked me, Are you sure you have Jesus in your heart? My response to that adult was, Sure. I go to church. I have to go to church. <laughs> but it was on that Sunday afternoon that the Lord just kept tugging and say, have you really? Sitting on an old dirt road with bicycle laying down. Jesus rescued me that day. He changed my heart. I knew with confidence that I had been saved and rescued. I want us to look this morning and think about those times. Maybe you can think about the time that the Lord came into your life. I want us to think about a story that I read this week. It was about this airplane and a, a stewardess who was on there. And she was rescued twice, two times, by two complete strangers who made a decision to intervene in her life within two days of each other. Her name was Kelly Duncan Moore, which means probably absolutely nothing to any of us. But if you can remember way back to January 13th, 1982, there was a Boeing 737, Air Florida, Flight 90, 
that took off just like a normal day. She was prepared for the flight. She was ready to move forward. On January 13th, 1982, Kelly Duncan Moore began her day just like she always had, never suspecting what the day had in store for her. Two minutes after the takeoff, Flight 90 began losing altitude and crashed into the bridge spanning the Potomac River. When Kelly came to, she was in frigid water of the Potomac, clinging clinging to a piece of wreckage with five other survivors. One of the survivors was clinging to a raft and helped Kelly and the other four into the rescue harnesses that the, of the helicopter hovering over them. One by one, before they were succumbed to hypothermia and slipping underneath the surface of the water, they were rescued. And so that's how she was rescued the first time. When Kelly came to the frigid water of the Potomac, not knowing what was going to happen to her, an unknowing person chose to help save the other five survivors. As they began to think of that and they were taken to the hospital and The stranger that she had never met was later identified as Arlen Williams, who had successfully helped rescue those five survivors, six survivors. Two days later, Kelly was rescued again. Listen to the words that she writes. A couple of days later, when I was moved from intensive care to a regular room, I woke to see a nurse standing over me. She smiled, covering my fingers with her warm, gentle hand. And she said to me, little girl, I could get in big trouble for doing this, but I need to tell you this. God loves you, and he saved you from that plane crash for a reason. In response to my eager interest to hear what she said, the nurse risked her job in telling me about the great love of Jesus. As she spoke of how he died for me, I responded by turning my life over to him. And for the first time, I felt real peace. When I prayed to accept Jesus, I asked God to show me how I could know him even more, and I knew that he would answer me. Not only that he, not only that, but that he had used two separate strangers in two days to first rescue my life and to secondly rescue my soul. When I began to think of that and just realizing that ordinary people were the ones who had impacted my life. They had no special ability or special calling, but they chose to put themselves into peril for my sake. Moore said, I don't know why God saved me from the Potomac that day when others around me died or why he answered my desperate prayer for contact with him. But I do know God used compassionate, ordinary people to bring his love to me at that point when I desperately needed it. In his infinite mercy, he rescued me, not once, but twice. He rescued me twice. By the same token, I want us to understand this morning that we are in the rescuing business. We have a responsibility to those around us. 
If you can recall in your life when you personally accepted Jesus Christ into your heart and life, you were rescued on that day. And once you were rescued on that day, it gives you the responsibility to tell someone else of what you have found. Familiar scripture that we're going to read this morning says, now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing disciples, more disciples than John. Although in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. We're gonna back up and look at that again. Although in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. You see, Jesus had been to the place and, and, and teaching his disciples in a way that they needed to understand what serving the Lord was all about. It says that Jesus wasn't doing the, the baptizing, but it said he had empowered, he had given authority to his disciples to baptize people into this new faith. You see, he was passing the responsibility on. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sitar, near the plot of ground Jacob had been given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you were a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that ask you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, most of the time when we read this portion of scripture, we begin to focus on the Samaritan woman that has this encounter with Jesus, this life-changing encounter But this morning, I want us to look at the fact of how Jesus interacted with this Samaritan woman. It wasn't just about her conversion. It wasn't just about a single encounter with Jesus. But I believe that Jesus is showing us and teaching us on how we are to become the rescuers for the spiritually hurting I think the very first thing that we see in the scripture is as John recorded it, he said, and Jesus had to go through Samaria. Now, it was the custom of that day, as I already said in scripture, the custom was that Jews would not associate with the Samaritans in any way. As a matter of fact, they would go out of their way to keep from running into each other. And it would have been customary at that time for Jesus and his disciples and those who were following him not to have gone through Samaria. They would have taken a much longer route around the Jordan to avoid having contact with the Samaritans. But John records that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Now, when we, when we see that, when we understand the emphasis there, we begin to see that Jesus had a specific purpose and reason for going to Samaria. And I think that's what he's trying to tell us as followers, as believers in Jesus Christ, that we need to go where those who need to hear the message are. It used to be, back 50 years ago, 75 years ago, that the church was the central place. The church was the place of gathering. The church was the place that everything happened. The church was the place that guys were supposed to come and find them a wife, a good wife. 
And so the church was a social place. As we have changed, as society has changed, it's not that way. So we need to understand that those who need to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ are not necessarily going to walk through our doors and say, tell me what you got. So I think Jesus is giving us the example that he chose to go to Samaria because he was going to have this encounter with the woman at the well. You see, Jesus had a balanced life. He knew his purpose for coming. He understood that he came to to bring salvation to the entire world. But at the same time, he always took time to get to know and befriend lost people one at a time. Yes, he spoke to the crowds. But as you follow through, you see him dealing with individuals one at a time, becoming involved in their lives. So I think what he's saying to us as believers, that we must venture into their environment, getting to know our neighbors, our salespeople, our service station attendants, schools, and people at school and people that we work with and begin to build relationships. You say, well, pastor, you don't know the kind of language they use. Well, Jesus knew she had been married seven times, but he still associated with her. Jesus was known as a friend to sinners. How are you known? Are you known as a stuck-up, snobby Christian? Are you known as someone who thinks they're better than everyone else? Or are you a friend to sinners? Now, that doesn't mean that we live the lifestyle that they live. That doesn't mean we live in the same place that they live and do the same things that they do. But it means that we create relationships, genuine relationships with individuals. If we're going to rescue people, the first thing that we need to do is meet people who don't know Jesus. We could sort of refer to them as pre-Christians. Isn't that our goal? We want them to become a Christian. We don't have to associate them with, well, we're meeting with those sinners. We're meeting with those people who cuss all the time. Wouldn't it be good to think of those that you come in contact with of potential Christians, potential followers of Jesus? There's a lot of them out there. There's a lot of them that we know personally. The second thing that I want us to see that Jesus did was in conversation, he began to build a bridge between a Samaritan and a Jew. As we look at at what the scripture says, it says that he began to to carry on a conversation. John records that he was tired and he was thirsty. Probably had nothing to draw from the well with. And at noontime, the hottest time of the day, a lady comes to draw water from the well. And Jesus begins to tear down the wall of separation. A wall that was built culturally. A law that was, a wall that was built socially. And he struck up a conversation. Not only with a woman, which was uncommon, but a Samaritan woman. Jesus was by communicating with her saying to her, you matter. You're important. I have confidence that you're going to give me a drink of water. And he began to break down the walls through communication and carry on the conversation. And she says, why would you even ask me? And he begins to explain himself. But I want to ask us, how many times do we rush past opportunities that God has placed someone right beside us? 
right in line at the grocery store. Right where we are. And we rush past the opportunity because we're too busy. I don't have time. We're too busy. I don't know that person. Oh, but if someone asks us about our children or our grandchildren, we can sure let it roll, can't we? Tell them all about them. But yet, we look for opportunities to share the love of Jesus. Building relationship bridges isn't difficult. It's conversation. It's making conversation in comfortable places. It's just like being here today. Mandy has beautiful children. Have you met Mandy? Not putting you on the spot, but I am. But she has two beautiful children. If you ran into her in the grocery store, how could you break up a conversation with her? Oh, how cute. And I guarantee she would smile. You would too if they were your kids. And we bring up that conversation in genuine interest. You see, when we begin to take a genuine interest in someone, our ears perk up, their ears perk up, and they begin to think and realize that it's not a dog-eat-dog world, that somebody cares. You see, sometimes we get so caught up in our own lives that someone will start a conversation and all of a sudden we've got to tell them about the ache that I got in my back and the sore foot that I've got and I've had a headache for two days and the kids are driving me crazy and you haven't learned a single thing about the person that you're talking to because we focus too much on me and telling our story. You see, the most important part in building relationships and understanding each other is to come to a place and listen. Find out about those who are around you. The third thing that we need to do to rescue someone spiritually is we need to lead them to safety. Lead them to a safe place. And we do that through our relationship with them. Through, through conversation. Maybe you go through the same teller line every week. They recognize your face. They're taught that when, when, they, when you leave, they say, thank you, Mr. Ledsom. How'd they know my name? It's on the deposit ticket for Pete's sake. You see, they're at least trying to create a relationship. Trying to make it personal with you. I'm afraid that we Christians sometimes make it so impersonal that no one wants to be a part of our lives. But if we are engaged and involved in the lives of others and genuinely care, can I tell you that children and teens know whether you're just telling them a bunch of junk or if you really care. They see through us. We need to be clear, transparent in our relationships. And our relationships with people can eventually begin going into a spiritual conversation. Now, most of you know I am a diet cocaholic. Every morning, Burger King Elkview to the point every morning, the girl that's there Monday through Thursday, I'll say, good morning. She'll say, diet Coke, no diet Coke. Because I always say, diet Coke, light ice. The next morning, she may say, diet Coke, a lot of ice. And we go through this little tit for tat back through there. 
I get up to the window and I ask her if she's having a good day. Some days it's good. A few days she's crying. And I tell her that I'll be praying for her. And she says, I need it. A few months ago, I may have shared this, but one of the managers came up through. I guess they hear my voice on the drive through thing. I don't know. But she came up to the window and she said, uh, could you pray for my son? I said, sure. I said, why don't I pull right up here and you come out? Her son was needing a liver transplant about the same time that Anthony's sister was. And she said, University of Kentucky has rejected him. She said, I'm afraid they've just sent him home to die. And we prayed. Every time I go through and I catch a glimpse of her, I'll ask her about her son. He's still living. As a matter of fact, last week, she came over to the window and she said, I just want you to know they approved my son for a liver transplant. You see, it has nothing to do, it has nothing to do with me but someone who will care enough to take time. And no, I'm not holding up the line if you're behind me because then you're grouchy to them. But sometimes it's just taking the time. Another girl there, I've been calling her Jessica for three months. She finally got enough nerve to say, my name's not Jessica. I said, well, who's Jessica? She said, I don't know, but it's not me. (laughs) She told me her name was Elizabeth. She's had a hard life, difficult times. She said, you know, my brother and I are talking about coming to visit your church sometime. I said, well, you're more than welcome. I said, it's come as you are. I said, you'll see all kinds of folks that look weird, but just come on in anyway. (laughs) You see, it doesn't take much to start a conversation. I didn't tell him I was a preacher until later. Occasionally, they, they find someone, one of them finally asks, well, what do you do? And I told him. But you see, it's not hard. And they need, we need to be the ones who lead people to a safe place. Instead of turning to alternative things like drugs and alcohol. And we need to be the ones who say, I have the living water. I have what you need. You see, Jesus used the circumstances of asking for water and turning it around to say, well, if you would only know and realize that you could ask me for a water that would never, you would never thirst again. So he took common conversation and turned it into a God moment of conversation. You see, the openings are there if we will look for them and then we'll take them. Sometimes it's a split-second decision. Sometimes we have to take a breath and then just trust God to give us the words. One of the greatest tricks of the devil is, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Trust God. He'll give you the words. He'll help you through. The last thing that I think that Jesus was teaching us is that we had to have confidence in the rescuer. 
We have to come to a place where we realize that we need rescued and that we can have confidence in the rescuer. Now, the ultimate rescuer is Jesus Christ. But we become the assistant in reaching out his hand through our hand. People want to see what being rescued looks like. What kind of example are you shining in your life at work? What kind of example are you shining in your life in your neighborhood? Do they see Jesus? Or do they see this old grumpy person who says they go to church? If what you do and how you live is no different than the rest of the world, why would anyone want the Christ that we have? You see, we're the example. We're the hands, we're the feet, we're the lips of Jesus. And they look to us. Let's look what happened. John 4, 28, the woman left her water jar beside the well. It was hot. It was noontime. She came for a specific purpose, to get water. But John records that she said, forget about the water. And she ran back to the village telling everyone, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah. That's a scary thought, isn't it? Come see the man who told me everything I ever did in my life. And you know what? The village knew all about her. And she says, I believe he could be the Messiah. So the people came streaming from the village to see him. She brought people back to Jesus, Samaritans back to Jesus to understand the importance of what she had experienced. You see, the disciples, the disciples went into town and they came back with bread and dried fish. The woman, on the other hand, fresh from her encounter with Jesus, brings back a crowd of spiritually lost people. What's it say to us? What's it say to us? She was thrilled at what the Lord had done for her and she had to tell others and she had to bring others with her to see and hear the good news. And so when we begin to look at that, the one thing that we need to understand in closing is that we need to have that spirit of rescue and need to understand the urgency in reaching those around us. The urgency. We all talk about it. We all look at the news and we say, oh my, time is short. Time's running out. The Lord's bound to return anytime soon. But the question is, do we have an urgency to let others know of his coming? To let others know what we've experienced? You see, do you remember that amazing grace that brought you to your knees? That time when you realized how great God's grace was and how great God was. Someone has said that in the church in general, that as time has gone along, the freshness of that amazing grace has become nothing more than fascinating grace. Maybe even just an interesting grace and for some just merely grace 
But there is something about that amazing grace of God that never runs out, that is always available. And so the good news is this, that we, when we get to heaven, will realize there are people that we have been instrumental in planting seeds. Maybe you didn't lead them to the Lord, but you told them about him. Maybe you had a little impact of giving them a, a, a gift card or some food or did something kind. But the bad news is this, that there will be people that we have missed the opportunity to tell them and show them Jesus and they'll spend eternity in hell. We have the responsibility. C.S. Lewis puts it this way, the gospel of Jesus Christ is either of overriding significance or it's of no importance at all. It cannot be moderately significant. C.S. Lewis is saying you can't ride the fence. Either get in or get off. Make your choice. Are you serving him or not? You can't ride the fence. The importance of knowing our responsibility. I've been rescued and now I have the responsibility to reach out a hand for someone else to come to know Jesus. I don't know where you are on this day. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus. Maybe you're like the woman at the well. You have a a past that you don't want anyone to know about. Today's a good day to come meet the Savior. It's a good day to come and draw close to him. Maybe today you feel as if maybe you've missed some opportunities. Maybe you want the Lord to say to you, open my eyes that I may see those who are coming to the well. And allow him to speak through you. Kelly's going to sing a little chorus. Would you bow your heads? If you need to know Jesus, maybe you don't know him personally. Today's the day. Find a place of prayer. Others will pray with you. Maybe if you need to renew your commitment and say, Father, I've I've missed opportunities, I know. But I desire to be your hands, your feet, your lips. Love people through me. Speak to people through me, not my words, but only you. As Kelly sings, would you be brave enough, man or woman enough, to find a place of prayer as we close this service. Love through me, love through me, oh Lord, love through me. Somewhere somebody needs your love today. Speak through me, speak through me, oh Lord, speak through me, make your word upon my lips a flame today, oh Lord, speak through me, love through me.
Father, we come into your presence. That is the prayer of our hearts. Love through me. Speak through me. For truly there are those all around us who just need your love. Who just need to know that someone cares. Lord, help us to be your lips, your hands, your feet. Take every effort that we give. And may it be a seed that is sown that will draw them to an understanding of your great love and salvation. Thank you, Father, for rescuing me. Thank you for full and free salvation. Thank you for your amazing grace. Be with us as we go from this place. Bring us back safely this evening as Pastor Bill shares with us from your word. We pray all of these things in the wonderful and loving name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.